Hello, and welcome to part two of aiming cannons at worms, except this time our worms have got, well, wind. Recall at the end of the last video we created a simple demonstration of a yellow thing shooting a cannon at a blue thing, and we could use the mouse to position the yellow and blue thing in space, and with the mouse wheel we could alter the muzzle velocity of the cannons, and we created a function which went and calculated the angle that the yellow thing should fire its cannon at to hit the blue thing, its projectile motion. And here is that function, and we can see it's not very long at all. It's called calculate trajectory, it takes in the source position in 2D, the target position in 2D, the strength of gravity acting in the world, and the muzzle velocity from the cannon. It returns a standard optional of a pair of floats, and those two floats are the two possible angles you can fire at to hit the target. If it's not possible to hit the target, then the optional is declared null. And the previous video looked at some detail into how we could derive the a, b and c parameters of a quadratic equation to then solve to give us those two angles. In this slightly more embellished demonstration, which depicted gravity by showing raindrops or snow or as somebody commented stars, we can see the force of gravity acting downwards towards the planet's surface. And it doesn't matter where we put the target, gravity always acts downwards. Games in this genre like to give the player an additional challenge. They like to throw in wind, which of course goes on to change the desired flight paths in order for the cannon to hit the target. Here we can see now that the gravity is also combined with the wind to give us a force that is no longer perpendicular to the floor. We have to fire into the wind in order to hit the target. Well, with one of our solutions. With the other solution, we can fire just low and fast to hit the target too. Calculating the angle to fire the cannon at now causes some problems for our current calculation. In what I promise is to be a very quick summary of the first video, we calculated theta by doing the following. We framed the problem as a two-dimensional problem relative to the source. So we have our y-axis and our x-axis. We made a critical assumption that gravity only affects the y-axis. Since no forces affected the x-axis, and knowing that speed equals distance over time, therefore time equals distance over speed, we could work out the time taken for the projectile to travel from the source to the target in the x-axis. Because we know the distance in the x-axis, and we didn't know the speed so much because we don't know theta. And that was what we were trying to work out. However, we could define t in terms of the distance travelled in the x-axis divided by the muzzle velocity cos theta. We then used this t to constrain the problem in the y-axis where we use the equation s equals ut plus half a t squared. We took all of this and substituted it for our t's. And because this is fundamentally a quadratic equation, we used the quadratic formula to find the roots, which in turn gave us the t's, and which in turn allowed us to calculate the theta. I found the derivation quite satisfying because a lot of it cancelled each other out on the way there, and we ended up with this very simple solution which we could easily replicate in code. So then, what happens if we have wind? Well, clearly whereas gravity only acts in the y-axis, we'll assume that wind only acts in the x-axis. Since we consider these to be two forces, we can sum them to get the resultant force. This now poses us a problem. When there were no forces acting horizontally along the x-axis, we could represent t as distance over speed. This is linear. Now we've got a force acting horizontally, we need to use s equals ut plus half a t squared. Or in the same parlance here, distance travelled equals initial velocity plus half our magic force t squared. And we'd need to rearrange this in terms of t. Well, to rearrange this in terms of t is some quadratic solution. There are two answers. We would need to rearrange it in terms of a, b and c again, and therefore we would end up with answers that look a lot like the quadratic formula. 
And if I just scroll back to the maths from the first video, it's a good job I keep all of this stuff, isn't it? We could then have to substitute all of that quadratic formula in for this t, and push it through all of these derivations again, and I don't really want to do that. It's probably well beyond my skill, although I'm sure some of the maths nerds out there might actually enjoy doing that. In short, the chances of success are very low, and the chances of boredom are very high, so I'm going to look at this from a different angle, literally. Unusually for an OLC video, I'm going to look at the end result, and then show how we got there, because I think this gives a better visual understanding of the process of transformation involved. I'm going to do this in an art package too, because I can't rotate things in OneNote, which is very frustrating. Firstly, I'm going to set the wind to some maximum, like that. And then I'm going to grab a screenshot. I've pasted the screenshot into an art package that I like, and I've just highlighted the parabolic trajectory so it's a bit more visible on the screen. I'm now going to place an axis, which just indicates the frame of the world relative to the source, and I'm going to set the rotation point of the image to be at the origin of that axis. I've created another axis in blue this time, but I've added this axis as a child of the screenshot. So if we rotate the screenshot, that axis should rotate too, and I'm going to place that on the origin. Now I'll add in a nice big yellow arrow pointing down. That represents gravity in the normal scheme of things. Finally, again as a child of the screenshot, I'm going to add this blue arrow. Now this blue arrow represents the combined force of the wind and gravity. And what we will see is actually this combined arrow represents an axis of reflection around the projectile's trajectory. Believe it or not, the projectile still follows a parabolic trajectory. It's a 2D system of a quadratic. It has no choice. The whole first video looked at solving the problem in terms of this big yellow arrow here. We've already got the code and the solution to do that, so let's reframe the whole problem by rotating the scene. So that our combined resultant force vector now points in the same direction as our gravity. We've rotated the scene by theta to ensure that our resultant force vector and our original gravity vector are parallel. Note that the target has also rotated too, but in terms of the original framing, we now have our x displacement and we have our y displacement. And if we know our dx and our dy and our muzzle velocity, we can use all of the code we created first time around to calculate the firing angle theta in terms of a system where we've only got gravity acting downwards. In this system, we can see what angle we need to fire the projectile at. But to restore it back to the original frame, we need to rotate that angle by our original theta. I guess what I'm trying to say is if you're the kind of viewer that went away from the last video and thought, oh, I'll add wind correction into that, and then went and derived all of that complicated quadratic stuff, uh, well, you didn't have to. The solution is actually very, very simple indeed. So let's take a look, but after this. In this episode we're going to be looking at Delta Light 2 by, uh, well it says Flapbox Studios on the Steam page, but actually it's a little collaboration between two members on the Discord server, Bixie and Veldin. The guys have released their product on Steam, and we can have a look at the Steam page here where it's described as a bullet hell. I actually remember this as being a game called Frenzy on the BBC Micro way back when, but this is a slightly more modified version of Frenzy and it's got some unique twists to it too. When it starts up you get a nice menu screen like this, and it kind of describes the look and feel of the whole gameplay experience. It's deliberately noisy, deliberately retro, and deliberately a bit crazy. After digesting some plot and selecting a character, it's time to start. The idea is to occupy 80% of the playfield's territory by drawing lines across it and capturing regions. When you capture a region it disappears, and is no longer available for the enemies to move around in. Occasionally throughout the playfield you'll see power-ups which affect the enemies and yourself. If the enemies hit your line whilst you're drawing it, you have a brief opportunity to try and get to the outside again before you get injured. On the whole it is very satisfying to play, and it does have a difficulty curve that gets pretty steep pretty quickly. 
Sometimes when you complete a level you get a new character to choose from, and they have different properties such as speed and health and other bonus modifiers. The game runs on Bixie's Luminovu engine, which is a bit similar to the Pixel Game engine in many regards except it uses the SDL framework as a back end. This means it's a bit more hardware capable than Pixel Game engine, and you can see that through the lavish effects being applied on literally every single frame of this game. There's explosions, particle effects, shading effects, it's all very colourful, very nice, and literally everything is moving about, all the time. One thing I couldn't quite get my head around was the scoring system. Uh, I don't really understand what the numbers mean, and the game insists on making sure that I understand I'm being rewarded. Very rewarded. Very, very, very rewarded. I'm sure that can be tweaked. The game has plenty of different enemies, plenty of different power-ups, and things that seem like boss battles. It's actually really addictive and very fun to play, and brings back so much nostalgia of the fun of the game Frenzy I used to have as a child. I'm always a bit envious when somebody releases something on Steam, because I've not. It takes a lot of patience and dedication to get that far. So kudos to you guys at Flatbox Studios, well done. And kudos to you Bixie as well for your Lumino Vu engine. And so there you have it, Delta Light 2 by Bixie and Veldin on the Discord server, using the Lumino engine. Crazy fun stuff guys, always good to see a project get as far as a Steam page. I've thrown some links to their stuff in the resources below. I'm starting with exactly the same code that we finished the previous video, and I'm going to add in a wind component. At the bottom of the onUserUpdate function, we had a small procedure which drew the projectile's trajectory, and it did so using realistic physics. We can see here ut plus half at squared, and our a, the force in that equation, was defined as this vector here, which only had gravity in the y-axis, it had no x component at all. So I'm going to add in our wind here. And instead of calling this gravity now, I'm going to call it force just to keep it tidy and meaningful. So let's take a look at what happens now. Well, we can see that the calculation to hit the target completely misses. In fact, the projectile is blown past the target. The projectile is following the correct rules, but we're aiming in the wrong direction now because we don't take into account the wind. This does show, however, that the projectile's path calculation is independent. If we look at the calculate trajectory function we created, we can see that we used to pass in gravity as a scalar value because it only affected the y-axis. I'm going to change this to our generic force in the 2D plane. The maths assumed everything only happened in the y-axis, so the magnitude of that scalar was sufficient. Now we need this to be the magnitude of our force. Hopefully it's apparent that the angle of our force vector is reasonably critical, so I'm going to create that at the start of this function, using the atan2 function. This angle tells us how much to rotate the target around the source, so that the force vector has no horizontal components and only lines up with the y-axis. This means that our target object is not quite in the right place anymore. I'm going to use a couple of pixel game engine tricks to make this a bit easier to calculate. By default, all operations between 2D vectors in Pixel Game Engine happen in Cartesian space, that is, x and y coordinates. Any point in Cartesian space can be represented in polar space, where you have a radius and a theta from the origin, by using the polar function. There's nothing especially complicated about this function, it just returns a vector where it's calculated the magnitude and the angle. Now we have the displacement between the target and the source as a polar coordinate. The x component of that vector represents the radius, and the y component represents the angle. Therefore, we can rotate this displacement by modifying the y component. And then we can convert that polar coordinate back into Cartesian space 
using the cart function. The Cartesian function is what you might expect. It creates a new vector using cosine and sine. This is just a cheeky way to rotate that target point around the source point without needing to dip into any trigonometry. We've now rotated the scene so that the only force in effect is that of the y-axis. So all of this can remain the same. The two resultant angles, however, are the solutions in that rotated frame. So we must rotate them back. And so with this change here and this change here, we've taken into account the force of wind. When we call the create trajectory function, we're still passing in our scalar. Let's change that now to be our force vector. And let's take a look. Hmm, well, it's a little bit discouraging. Something's not working very well at all. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, in fact, it kind of looks like everything is a bit 90 degrees out of place. I think I know what the problem is. The ATAN2 function has a bit of a quirk where it doesn't necessarily return angles in the same space as everything else that we're doing. They're usually 90 degrees out. So let's try it now. That's better. So now we can see, remember we have a small amount of wind blowing horizontally along the x-axis that we have to aim a little bit more vertically in order to hit the target. I think we should put in something to visualise that force vector now. I'll start by finding the midpoint between the source and the target. Then for convenience, I'll normalise the force vector. Then as I did with the horizon, I'm going to draw from the midpoint along that normal in both directions. And I'm going to draw this line in cyan. Let's take a look. Well, that looks like it's working quite nicely. Let's add in some controls so we can control the wind component of this force field. I've added in three key sensitivities to the left, right and spacebar keys to increase or decrease the wind value or just reset it to zero. Here we see the application with no wind at all, so this is exactly what we had before, and the dotted blue line shows us the direction of the force field. We can assume it's always going down in this case. We can move the target around and we can see the trajectories are calculated just fine. If I use the arrow keys now to add some wind to this, we can see when the wind is really strongly blowing along this line, we need to shoot directly into the wind and let the wind carry the projectile over to the target. We may need more muzzle velocity in order to get a solution, of course. Let's try the wind going the other way. So we can see now the wind assists us in getting towards the target, but we need to drop on it. So we don't want too much angle to begin with. And we also perhaps need to reduce the muzzle velocities. Either way, we can see we've now got a fairly universal solution for taking on a non-vertical force affecting our projectile. We are making a few bold assumptions with this. We're assuming that there is no real wind resistance and that the wind doesn't change during the trajectory of the projectile. However, I think that's completely sufficient for a game like Worms. And so there you have it, perhaps a first for the One Lone Coder channel, a reasonably small amount of code that makes a significant difference to the performance of that algorithm. I like it a lot. Now this little mini-series is complete, I'll provide the source code below. I'll also upload a PGE Tinker version of it too. If you've enjoyed this video, a big thumbs up please, have a think about subscribing, and I'll see you next time. Take care.